and we are live hi everybody welcome or welcome back to adventures with disabilities i'm going to be pivoting today we're not going to be talking about sewing instead we're going to be talking about therapeutic horseback riding and my very first baby steps towards hopefully qualifying as and competing as a paradressage rider let's dive in guys so if you don't know me i started riding when i was eight years old and tried to do it through most of my adult life i competed in college and after college and this was the furthest i ever made it this was a intercollegiate national show down in murfreesboro tennessee i'm going to tell you a little more about that ride later on but where I've been more recently with my riding, as my health has declined, is I have started um, therapeutic horseback riding. I first got back into the saddle after, unfortunately, many years away. In hindsight, I feel like horseback riding was something that held my body together <laughs> and I kind of got sicker and my pain was worse when I wasn't doing it. So back in 2018, my health was on a little bit of an upswing and I started riding at Unicorn Therapeutic Riding and it was amazing. When I got back up in the saddle for the first time after eight years away, never thinking that I would physically be able to ride again, it was just such an incredible feeling. And my coach there, even, um, she, she's just amazing. So as I was training and riding and getting stronger through horseback riding and also through Pilates, which was very helpful as well, I competed in two horse shows, two dressage shows. And the horse that I was riding at that time, Secret Agent, was such an amazing horse and we scored very well. I think in my first dressage show I got like a 67% with Secret Agent, which is really good. It was the training level test one. So it was like walk, trot, canter, nothing super fancy. There's no lateral movements or anything like that. But it was just awesome. And so I was flying high, right? Fast forward a few months in 2018 and my health conditions significantly deteriorated to the point where I went on a medical leave from work and it turned out to be um, ultimately permanent disability um, from my former career and in fact from any career. So where my health is right now, it's a little bit confusing because for the most part, I'm pretty laid up, and I'm not gonna go into too many specifics here, but as some of you other folks with chronic pain or chronic health conditions might um, be familiar with, my conditions can kind of wax and wane, and that is unpredictable, and it's also sometimes, sometimes not a little bit seasonal. Now, what I wanna tell you is Last year, I went on a trip, an amazing once-in-a-lifetime trip, to a ranch out in Montana. And it's like, why Montana? Well, it's not totally random. I actually got um, some of my education was in Montana. And it's very, it's the place closest to my heart out of anywhere in the world, um, Missoula, Montana. So I was there last year in the summertime, and I'm recognizing that... First of all, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. There's horses, there's mountains. I love it, I love all of it. But in addition to that, the humidity is a lot less in Montana than it is here on the East Coast. And so my body is like loving it. I'm still really always in a lot of pain, but I was a little bit surprised about how much I could do and how much I actually pushed myself probably more than I should have when I was out there. But what I'm looping back around to is the ups and downs of my physical condition and the baby steps of progress and then the step backs in progress and the 
potentially weeks or months of um, near incapacitation, it's very challenging to figure out what I'm capable of and what is beyond my limits. And in fact, I kind of equate it to throwing darts at a dartboard in the dark and not knowing where it's gonna stick. I could wake up one morning and I could be like, hey, I slept last night, the humidity's perfect, the temperature's grand. I didn't have any of my joints slip out of the sockets last night. Like there's a whole array of things that can go right that help me, but for the most part, every single day I'm dealing with multiple physical things or environmental things completely beyond my control, recovering from an activity two or three days previously. It's a lot, right? So with all this uncertainty, how could sports, how could adaptive sports, how could therapeutic horseback riding fit into this? Is there room for it, first of all? It's a great question, and I think the answer for me is yes. I have the passion, the grit, the drive, the dedication, the absolute horse craziness that I've had since a little girl to make this dream a possibility. So I'm gonna walk you through the first steps that I've taken, and wouldn't you know, the first steps are paperwork, which I am intimately acquainted with. I'm gonna show you what forms are required to apply for um, the classification and assessment that hopefully could lead to somebody being a qualified para-equestrian. What this is, it's the medical diagnosis form, and this needs to be completed by your physician. It's then submitted to US Equestrian, um, specifically to the para-equestrian division. So who did I ask out of my numerous, numerous physicians to complete this form for me? I used my neurologist. This is not my neurosurgeon, um, but this is somebody who treats my chronic migraines. And he's been upfront with me. He's like, Terry, I have no experience with occult tethered cord syndrome. I have no, uh, he's aware of what Chiari malformation is, but he is, you know, it's above his pay scale. However, what he can do is he can write the diagnoses and he can say, see attached notes. So I, um, I got his sign off on here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some controversy that comes up with um, para-equestrian sports. I don't want to be involved in any controversy, but it's sometimes unavoidable, right? It's asking for impairments that arise from the diagnosis. So he checked off some for me, and there's actually someone here I feel he could have checked off that he missed. But when we look at additional health conditions, Look what's on here, hypermobility, joint instability, and pain. So one of my primary diagnoses is hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, for me, that was diagnosed in 2014. And these other neurological um, cardiac conditions that I live with may or may not be because of that particular diagnosis. I also have more diagnoses. If, if you're looking for a diagnosis, come to me, I can hook you up. So the point is, the controversy with para-equestrian is joint hypermobility, joint instability, and chronic pain are not qualifying medical conditions, period. And um, a friend of mine from the UK sent me this really, you know, eye-opening article. I'm too disabled to compete, and I'm also not disabled enough to compete, right? So we're kind of falling in the cracks here. The woman's name is Vicki Hoban, and she seems like an amazing person. Um, we recently connected, and I'm hoping to get to know her better. But yeah, exactly. I can't compete in able-bodied or para-classes. Disabled rider calls for change. There is the possibility. There's a good possibility. Um, and I don't know how many riders this happens to, but... What if I go through all this, you know, the medical forms, the fees, the travel, the transport, all to get to this uh, event where a classifier can classify me? What if I'm not disabled enough? 
If you're not familiar with paradressage, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the basics, and there's also a link in the description to a video that explains it. Um, but basically, riders are classified based on their level of impairment. So class one is riders who are the most significantly impaired, um, often quadriplegics. And then there's classes, um, classifications that go down to group five. And, you know, there, there's basically um, people who are trained in classifying. I don't know exactly, like, what their qualifications are. What I do know is with a lot of horse showing um, and often with a lot of medical as well, the assessments, the, the grading, these things are somewhat subjective. And so I don't know what I'm gonna get. And honestly, maybe I could be classified as one thing on one day and the next day I could classify as something completely different. And that's another thing that has come up as far as controversy. Like there are some paradressage and other para-equestrian riders who were qualified or classified 20 years ago. And it's my understanding that there's no process for them to be reconsidered. You know, maybe their condition has worsened over the years. Maybe they've regained some function. But it seems like once you're classified, you might kind of end up stuck in that spot. So there's, I think, room for improvements with the classification. But knowing what I know about EDS, and um, I feel that I have a little bit of a leg up there, just knowing that, um, you know, we're going to have to provide medical documentation that supports these other conditions of mine. So I'm going to tell you about a horseback riding experience of mine. <laughs> It's like, who does this girl think she is? 43 years old. This is the last time I was on a horse. This was summer um, 2023. Look at how gorgeous this horse is, guys. I was out in Montana, vacation of my dreams, riding this beautiful guy. His name is Butte, and we are in the Bitterroot Mountains. Gorgeous. Let me tell you about my one time at a national um, level competition. This is me back in 2004. And again, this was in, oh my gosh, look at my bubble helmet. Do you guys remember these? <laughs> and how about the colors? Like, oh my goodness. All right, so this very beautiful horse was my ride. And if you're not familiar with IHSA, um, Intercollegiate Horse Show Association, the way that it works is you randomly draw a horse and that levels the playing field, right? So um, it levels the playing field in two important ways. One, IHSA competition is affordable. And two, you don't need to have your own horse. You are getting a random horse that you've never ridden before and everyone else in your class is also um, dealing with the same thing. So this very handsome guy and I, um, we were having a great ride, right? And then I'm gonna I'm gonna show you my face for this story because it's frankly um, I don't talk about it a lot. It's it was very traumatic. So I'm having this ride. It's in this beautiful arena. There's I don't know how many people in my class. I was actually competing in the alumni division, so that's kind of the only way I got there because I was the only alumni rider basically competing in my zone in Montana. <laughs> So I kind of feel like a fraud from the beginning. I'm like, these riders are so good. They're the best of the best. So anyway, let's set that self-judgment aside. And let's just say that the horse I rode seemed to have some kind of issue, possibly with the tack or some unknown circumstance arose. And the horse took off with me. Um, he was galloping around the ring. I I think it was during like when we were supposed to be cantering. I think he just took off and started booking it. We are flying and I am so embarrassed first of all cuz you know embarrassment is kind of the first thing like what's happening? And the next thing, I'm looking at this concrete wall and I'm terrified that I'm going to fly off this horse 
hit up against this wall and become paralyzed. Like I was actually afraid for my life. And um, it's hard to come back from that, right? So ultimately I get the horse to stop, slow down. And of course my coach is at the sidelines like, re-ride, re-ride, like what is happening? At that time I was training with the University of Montana equestrian team and my coach, she was like, no, 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 like this is not the rider's fault. Something went wrong, we need a re-ride. So this is all going on. The judges and the stewards are all, um, you know, having their conversations. My coach is talking with them and all the riders in the ring, including me, shocked out of my mind, terrified, my heart rate going a million miles a minute. We're walking around, walking around, the class is on hold. And I'm just, I was so embarrassed, right? It was nuts, it was nuts. And then I did end up, I got the re-ride. I don't remember anything about my second ride beyond the fact that I was like really mortified and I didn't end up placing in the class, which was so unfortunate because, you know, everybody got a new horse. The first ride was not to be considered at all. But like I said, it's hard to come back from that, right? <laughs> so here's hoping because the horses that I'm going to be riding, I don't know all of them yet. One of them I know, her name is Daisy and she is at Unicorn Therapeutic Riding. They're trained therapy horses, and it's amazing what a person can do on a horse. I don't care if you're disabled, I don't care if you're able-bodied, like, put me on a horse and I can do a whole lot more than maybe I can do when I'm sitting in Triscuit, my power wheelchair, or when I'm riding Sea Bisquick my a-linker walking bike <laughs> right like that is a really powerful force to be reckoned with equine therapy is very close to my heart i am um working to possibly be a volunteer maybe as soon as this summer and there's a ranch out in montana i mentioned uh dunrovin ranch and there's a nonprofit that the ranch organizes and the whole point of it is using horses and nature to help people who are isolated, who are living with physical or mental health conditions, who just, you know, I don't know for me what can be more healing and nurturing than time spent with nature or especially for me with horses. So days at Dunrovin and friends of Dunrovin have web cameras. And that's how I found this ranch. I was looking for a place in Montana to have a party. And I found this ranch where the owners, like part of having a guest ranch is wanting to share it with people. I share my guest ranch internationally across the world using these web cameras. So it's really cool. I've got about this much experience with YouTube now, and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to bring some more programming or other skills um, to the cause. When I'm up on a horse, I'm not thinking about my pain, but it ain't cheap. Funding. How do I fund this adventure to try to become a para-equestrian? Well, I'll tell you about one organization I stumbled across, Team Catapult. Never heard of them before. Check the description for more information. But what they do is they provide grants and funding for athletes with disabilities. They have grants open right now. It can be used towards competition fees, transportation and lodging, equipment purchases, coaching and training fees, and more. And here's where we apply. Applications close on May 30th. All right, so that's not too far away. It's a Google form. There's 14 pages, but I emailed Team Catapult and they got back to me right away. I asked them a few questions because it seems like Team Catapult is based in Houston. This was the most important question. Is your funding and are your grants, are they open to para-equestrians? <laughs> they said yes. Yes! And I'm like, woohoo! So Team Catapult, watch out. I am going to be applying for this grant and I'm crossing my fingers that y'all will come through with some funding because I need to get back on a horse. That's the easy part. It's 
all the before and after that is really hard because here <laughs> is how close I got to the barn last Sunday. I had a ride. I just physically could not do it last Sunday. So here's hoping that this Sunday I might be back up in the saddle. Wish me luck. Put me on a horse and I can rule the world. And thank you so much for watching. Happy creating, happy riding, and take good care. Bye-bye.